Throughout history, keeping track of time has always been important, but it is perhaps more important today than ever before. Our electronic systems must keep precise time to determine exactly where we are using GPS systems, to calculate the distance to an object on the road ahead, and to support high-speed communication. As you will hear today, the oscillators that generate the clock signals inside our electronic devices have themselves become complex engineering systems. So stick around to learn more. Welcome to Tech Chat, sponsored by Mauser Electronics, where we chat with experts about the latest technical innovations in the electrical engineering industry. On today's Tech Chat, we are pleased to have back with us Ron Demko, a Components Fellow at Kyocera AVX. Ron, welcome back to Tech Chat. Thank you, Dale. It's good to be here. Well, and I'm glad to have you here because I know every time that you come on, I learn a lot about things that are kind of magic. So I'm looking forward to our talk today. Well, this should be a good one. Timing solutions are very important as system speeds and the complexity of those systems increase. And now we have more interconnected, more network systems that require an improved accuracy for timing. So these platform oscillators that we're going to talk about today, they're a very good way to improve electrical performance reliability, ease of design or redesign, and also get a good lead time on a product. Well, that sounds great. So can you start us off with kind of an agenda? Sure. Let's jump into the outline. Um, and really, the, the whole point of this is to learn about platform oscillators. Now, they're a way to have a, a very easy redesign as your board shrinks. They will improve the electrical characteristics that are going to improve reliability. We'll prove all of this as we go through this outline. And really, as we get into this, we're going to look at the proprietary structure of this device. We're going to learn that material systems really matter. The quality of those material systems matter. Um, tightly controlled manufacturing matters. Conservative design matters. That's all going to impact reliability and electrical stability. We'll then look at the performance and the reliability. We'll look at some quick electrical comparisons and then a thermal cycle test comparison. We'll leave the improved availability as homework for the listeners and then finally have a very high level review as a summary. Well, that sounds great. Now, before we jump into all the technical details, uh, I'm sure that some people in our audience are really not familiar with Kyocera AVX. So could you give us an introduction to the company? Absolutely. And it's very important to understand how we got to have the skills to create these platform oscillators. When you're building these, the material quality is absolutely essential. Processing accuracy is very important. Uh, the design, uh, basically the ability to simulate designs, also critical to getting an advanced timing device. So here's how we got those skills over time. Back in 71, Kyocera began manufacturing MLCCs, and likewise, AVX did in approximately 1972. Now, Kyocera expanded in 1973 with the Kukubu factory. Uh, they really concentrated on, on miniature devices, high CV devices, specialty formulations. So they, they started forming a, a very fundamental and sound, accurate uh, ability to build these types of parts. So a very good tool set. About 77, uh, AVX started working on higher reliability type of devices, lower inductance, special terminations. In 79, it expanded to uh, Coleraine in Northern Ireland. That was high volume in automotive or high performance ceramics. Uh, in between that time, there were some thin film factories that were established. So there were thin film capabilities. In 1990, we merged with Kyocera. In 2020, we became a wholly owned subsidiary of Kyocera after the merger. And 2021, we're integrated and rebranded to Kyocera AVX. It's very important that it's uh, known that we have full access uh, both ways to all fundamental R&D, the processes, the material systems, designs, simulations. It's really a very strong combined team. And you'll see the results in the products that are coming out. Well, that's great. It's good to see companies that have really withstood the test of time in our industry, which through the 50 plus years you're talking here, has really gone through some incredible transformations. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess it didn't seem like 50 years. I've been here for a good portion of them. All right. Well, let's talk some technology now. Okay. Well, what we have here, it's a complicated slide. It's very important. When we look at how we get to this high quality product, First, you have to start off with a very good material system. 
Now these crystal blanks, we use autoclaves to grow high quality crystals. Uh, there's photolith that's involved. There's some plasma chemical vapor machining that's involved to get that preparation and the uh, structuring of the, of the devices. But basically we have a very high quality crystal blank. And of course the quality of the material system is going to impact the ESR. Um, higher quality is going to drive the ESR lower. It drives the drift lower and it tightens the temperature characteristic. So we have to start off with the best material system possible. And that's what we have. Now in terms of structuring, the structuring process itself and the accuracy of that process has some very important impacts as well on performance. Uh, that improves things like phase noise. And of course, that's critical. Uh, it will reduce the current consumption, also very critical in, in today's circuitry. It's going to give us a, a tighter oscillation margin and it gives us uh, tighter temperature characteristics. So, you know, we start off with this uh, crystal blank, we, we, which is high quality. We structure it. We have a custom developed IC that's built specifically for this. And in the following slides, we're going to see basically that there's a very simple design that's used across multiple case sizes. That simple design is based upon a constant performing head unit with a constant IC. And that basic stability will improve the reliability and the performance of this device throughout all the applications that we'll talk about. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I mean, you have a complex system in a package just to get a clock signal out. Yes, that's right. And the stability of that signal from part to part and case size to case size is something that the engineers could really bank on with this technology. Well, now these next two slides are very important. And they're actually identical slides. The first one talks about the conventional structure on top. And the bottom part of the slide is left as reference. The bottom part of the slide is the device that we build. So let's talk about the conventional structure, the one that we're replacing with those platform oscillators. What we should do here is compare the individual mechanics and how this thing is designed with the conventional to the platform structure. So on the top left, you see that conventional structure. And we're starting off with a ceramic package that we are looking at. The manufacturers of this type of device then put an integrated circuit deeply inside that ceramic package. They'll affix that with perhaps conductive epoxy or some form of epoxies or other adhesives. They will then do a wire bond operation connecting the IC to the ceramic uh, structures and lines. Then there'll be a crystal blank put in with a silver paste then there'll be a ceramic package. It's quite interesting that in this particular design of the competition, they may have four different case sizes. So four different packages, but within those packages, the crystal blanks are going to vary a great deal. That's going to vary by the size of the package and the, by the specific frequency within the package. And then there's going to be an IC, which is different depending upon the size of the crystal, and the spec of the crystal. So there's an enormous number of complications involved in designing that conventional structure. Now, if we go to the next slide, we'll change the order of what we're looking at. Now we're looking at the platform structure. This is the device that we build, and we'd like to show that it's quite a bit simpler to uh, create this device. Now, off on the left side, you'll see that head unit. The head unit is actually a combination, basically of a crystal and then of an integrated circuit underneath it. And to simplify things, that head unit is a 2016 size. It's a 2016 size across all of the uh, designs that we build. So it's a, a constant device, crystal plus the IC. Now that is affixed to this base substrate. That base substrate can vary from a 2016, it goes all the way up to a 7050. There's only five different combinations of what we have to build. So it makes a lot of sense in terms of us building that device 
to design it this way. The other important thing is that this gives you a tremendous option as a designer. Your design might start off with a 70-50, and then through time, your end product shrinks in terms of its size, so you'd like to shrink the timing device. Well, we could go to a 2016, and it's essentially the same device. It's In fact, it's the exact same device. It's the same head unit with a different base substrate. So redesigning or, or shrinking your end system with the platform structure is absolutely simple. And that's a tremendous advantage for the designer. Ron, this is a really interesting approach to solving an old problem. You guys have kind of stepped back and, and rethought the whole challenge ahead of you and, and approached it in a different manner. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, the stability that we gain by using the, the head unit is, is tremendous in terms of the future system requirements for timing and the reliability that we get because of the base unit interface to the end customer product is increased. It's, it's very good reliability. And of course, from a manufacturing point of view, this allows us to get that better lead time, which is exceptionally important to all users at this point. Well, that's absolutely right, Ron. I can see those advantages. And speaking of those advantages, why don't you tell us some of the other ones of the platform structure oscillator? Let's take a look at that platform structure. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at assembly limitations and how those impact aging. Now, the platform structure is absolutely optimized by its assembly operation. On the left-hand side of this page, what we're looking at is the aging characteristics of a platform structure in the graph. And then on the right-hand side, we're looking at the conventional structure's aging characteristics. So right off the bat, you could see a much better aging characteristic on the device which we build, the platform structure. Now, we could explain that. And we could explain it by the way we're able to build and anneal this part. Now, first off, we talked about crystal mounting. And mounting is, is, of course, very important. It must be high temperature annealed. Then there's a frequency adjustment. There's another annealing after that. There's a welding. And then there's a, a, a final anneal, which is just a, a seam weld anneal. Then we could mount the IC, and then it's put on the printed circuit board on that interface. So it's a simple structure and a very simple process where we can optimize each of the characteristics of that blank and of that crystal as it goes through the process. Now let's go over to the right-hand side. Let's look at the conventional structure. It starts off with the IC mounting. And remember, that was where we put that IC or where the other manufacturers put that IC deep inside that ceramic package. So that has to occur first. After that, and after the lead attach and wire bonding, the crystal is mounted. So after the crystal is mounted, the normal requirement or the desired operational step would be a, a high temperature anneal. Well, that cannot occur in that conventional manufacturing process because it would damage the IC. So a non-optimized heat treatment is performed. Then there's frequency adjustment, another non-optimized heat treatment is performed. There's a seam weld and then a seam anneal. So it's a very different manufacturing flow between the conventional structure and the platform structure. And the proof of the quality in the manufacturing steps is shown in the aging characteristic. The superiority of the platform structure is, is a very good aging characteristic. Is it just the annealing steps that are providing the improved aging characteristics? Well, there's a few things that are occurring beyond that that we don't really talk about, but that's a very big portion of it. Okay. Next, let's look at the impact of design reliability. And that platform design has a head unit which is soldered onto a carrier substrate. There's an epoxy underfill on the periphery of that head unit in addition to the solder. So in the top left corner of this page, we could see that there's a coefficient of thermal expansion of 12. And that will go on top of a printed circuit board for a customer that might be in the world of 10 
to 14. So that's essentially a pretty good match. It's a very good match, in fact. Now, underneath the platform structure, you see the conventional structure, and that shows a coefficient of thermal expansion of approximately 7.2. And that 7.2 is going to be placed upon a board which is expanding somewhere in the 10 to 14 region. So there's a fairly significant mismatch in the CTE of the conventional structure. So between these two columns, we have something called TCT. That's our thermal cycle test. And we're doing a thermal cycle test here to show the result of many cycles, in fact, a thousand cycles that range from negative 55 C to 125 C. There's a 30 minute transition period across those temperature extremes. And the top right corner shows the platform structure and it shows the, the, uh, the printed circuit board, the carrier board of our device. It shows the solder fillet and then the customer printed circuit board on the bottom. But what you'll notice here is that there's no cracks. It's a, it's a nicely formed fillet, no cracks, and that's because the CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion, is essentially matched. Now, in the world of the conventional structure device, you have a ceramic, which is soldered, and then it goes directly onto the customer printed circuit board, and there's a crack occurring underneath it. So that's a hugely concerning thing, and that crack could provide intermittent electricals across temperature. It could cause total failure, in fact, rather than intermittence. But either way, it's a, and it's an enormous problem in any environment that would have a, a number of, of temperature coefficient of expansion induced stress cycles on it. And this really highlights, Ron, one of the things that I've learned, I guess, about reliability in my 30 years in the industry is that the failures are almost always at these connection points. It's not the individual devices that fail. It's these connections that fail when you do things like thermal cycling. Yes, that's right. And, you know, there's some further things here. It's going to vary by end customer, too, because they might have different copper weight. They might have different copper. Well, in fact, they probably will have different copper weight. They'll have different uh, trace widths. They'll have different TCEs, in fact, 10 to 14. So this is going to be a, a really big topic as systems get more complicated, perhaps an EV it's exceptionally important that we worry about the number of thermal cycles that a system is going to see. Platform structure wins hand is down. Yeah, those are all great points. Um, now, Ron, you've introduced us to some of the stability and reliability improvements and those specifications. What can you tell us about the electrical characteristics of these platform structure oscillators? Yeah, Dale, it's a good time to recap those electrical characteristics. We, we know it's a highly reliable device. We know it doesn't age nearly at the same rate as the conventional devices. That's a major advantage for us. So what we're looking at here is a table. And we have two different series of these platform oscillators. There's the K series, which has an E-type device. Now that's a low current consumption device. It's a low noise device. Now that actually has low jitter by a non-PLL method. And what you'll find there is the frequency ranges from 1.5 megahertz to 160 megs. There's five different case sizes that are available. Um, the current consumption is very good. Frequency stability looks good. The jitter numbers looks good. The jitter's coming in at 0 0.15, and it has a wide voltage range. So K-series looks great for low current consumption with non-PLL. Now, the Z-series, is it comes in two different types, X and Y. Now, the X-series is a wide frequency range. It's basically 500 kilohertz up to 170 megahertz. That is obtained really by a PLL. It's got a short lead time, of course, because this actually is a very high volume device. It looks great in terms of the multiple voltages. Jitter is still okay. And uh, current consumption is, is acceptable based on a typical cross-section of designs that are out there. And then there's a Y type in that Z series. It has a, a low jitter as well. The low jitter there is achieved by a non-PLL means. It's a very, it's a tight stability device. You can see that the number looks quite uh, solid there. 
jitter looks acceptable, great current consumption, and they're again a wide a wide voltage rating. The Z series Y type has four predominant frequencies. That is 24 megs, 25, 50, and 60 megahertz. It's important to note that there's a 32 kilohertz oscillator. It's a similar design platform device, and it's available in three different case sizes, a 2016, 2520, and a 3225. There's an auto grade and industrial grade de uh, device option, and these are very solid electrically performing devices. We could see right off the bat, there's a, an acceptable uh, voltage range, a very good, wide, easy to hit voltage range for the device. Temperature ratings, of course, for automotive are negative 40 to 125. For the industrial, we have a, a smaller temperature range there. Then frequency stability numbers, the, the aging, the, the load change with shock and vibe, they all look very solid. And there's a good startup time on, on these devices as well. So this is a neat solution to the 32 kilohertz oscillator, which is used so frequently out there. And again, it's a high reliability device with these exceptional aging characteristics. And that picture there just reminds me that, you, that those are really the same product, just in a different form factor. Yes, that's right. It's really a, a neat thing to see that we're using that same head unit, the same electrical characteristics, and there's just a different interface on how we get that signal to the board. Yeah. So again, as you kind of highlighted earlier, for someone designing initially with that larger size on the right, in this case here in the image, and then they're ready to shrink down to smaller sizes, they can move down in size without having to worry about any changes in the specification or the performance. Yes, that's right. Makes it simple. Plus, the thing is, you know, it's a very uh, highly uh, reliable part because of the TCE or, or the CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion similarities. And the aging characteristics, the electricals look great. It's really a part that's times come. It makes a, an awful lot of sense in design. Yeah, it really does make a lot of sense. Once you see it in front of you, it's very exciting. So now what we'd like to do is do a, a high-level overview comparing that conventional ceramic package oscillator to the platform oscillator. Now, the top row that general clock oscillator, we call it a one-room ceramic package. And remember where we had that large ceramic package with the IC deeply buried inside it. We had the wire bonds attaching that IC to the traces within the ceramic package. And then we had the crystal blank and then a cover lid. So that's the device. We're calling it a one-room. It's a conventional package. We're going to look at that versus the different platform structures, the K-series and then both options for the Z series. First off, we could see that the cost on that general clock oscillator, the single room device, that's quite high. That's represented with the X. Now it has perhaps has a fair lead time. It has a, a good enough reliability, but it's not an optimized reliability. That's the general clock oscillator, the, the ceramic device. It's been used a long time, but, but there's a way to make it better. And the way to make that better is to go with the platform structure oscillator. Now, the platform structure oscillator has quite a few advantages. We show that 32 kilohertz device, the one we looked at in the last slide, under the K-series device. And then we also show the 1.5 meg to 160 meg uh, K-series devices as well. Those have really a, a very good stability. It's quite fair over the, the frequency range. Jitter is outstanding. The reliability is outstanding. Let's look at the next structure, and that's the ZX series. That's the one that has the PLL in it. So that's how we get the water frequency range of 0.5 megahertz to 170 megs. And that has an incredibly good frequency stability and over the temperature. It's, it's very tight. Jitter looks good. And then reliability, the lead time, and the cost, that's outstanding. Obviously, this is a very high runner. It's a very standard device which could be used on a very wide variety of designs and then finally there's the platform structure in the zy series that's where we've got those four frequencies the 24 25 50 and 60 that has outstanding jitter it also has outstanding reliability with good cost on that as well so that's a pretty high level summary but the real key to all of this 
is the increased reliability that we're going to get with the platform oscillator. And that's really key as printed circuit boards operate higher uh, temperatures, higher number of thermal cycles. They're out in the extremes more often. It's a real concern that we're alleviating by having a device which has a CTE match to the board. Also, of course, it has the optimized electrical characteristics because of its assembly. And plus the fact that we have a very high quality material system to start with, that gives us all of those initial advantages that we have talked about. Well, that's a really helpful table to see everything kind of side by side and, and help designers out there to select the right product for the systems they're building. Yes, that's right. It, it's really, it makes it very easy. And as you get into the individual uh, spec sheets for, for each one of these devices, that's where you'll see that, you know, the quality of that material system, you'll see it generally a good ESR. It, you'll see that lower drift. You'll see the, the tighter temperature characteristics. And then when you start looking at how we structure these things with, with the photolith and the, the chemical vapor machining, that's where we get the advantages, where we've got an improved phase noise, uh, improved jitter, and we've got the reduced current consumption, the tighter oscillation margins, and, and tighter temperature characteristics. So I really encourage people to look at the individual spec sheets for these devices on the on the website that we have. Yeah, that's good advice to right, send everybody out to check out these specs. Obviously, you're just giving us an overview. Now, Ron, we're approaching the end of today's chat. Can you provide us with some key takeaways from our discussion? Sure. Well, what we have is a very unique process, and it's it's I think it's a wonderful process where we control basically all of the material systems and the processes and the, the packaging all by ourselves. So we're not dependent upon uh, any other sources and it's a very stable design. It's an optimized process for improved frequency stability characteristics that we had talked about. And of course, there is the improved reliability as a result of that interface substrate. Possibly one of the most important things is the ability to downsize your designs very easily. And there's no need for a major redesign on this part when you could just use that same head unit on a different interface substrate that's attached to it. And uh, of course, improved lead times are going to be a, a real attraction for uh, all the end users that are out there. Yeah, I'm sure they are. <laughs> if anything, we've learned the last few years, lead time is almost as important as how well the product works. Yes, that's absolutely true. <laughs> well, thank you, Ron, for that introduction to the Kyocera AVX Platform Structure Oscillator. It was great having you back on Tech Chat. Your presentations are always very educational. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it, Dale. Before we leave today, we want to thank our sponsor, Mauser Electronics, for supporting these Tech Chats. If you're looking to learn more or purchase any of these amazing oscillators we have learned about today or other great Kyocera AVX products, please go visit our friends at mauser.com. And join us again next time on Tech Chat, where we chat with the leading technical experts like Ron Demko from industry-leading companies like Kyocera AVX, who are changing our world every day.